It's Thursday, it's just after 11 o'clock, and welcome to the second in our series of corporate travel webinars. Our topic today, has video killed the meeting star? And over the next hour, uh, we're gonna be talking about changes within the sector, how demand is evolving, and uh, everything else in and around that particular topic. We've got a few introductory slides before we come to introduce our panel this morning. Uh, Engage, which is the corporate travel stream of urban living. More about that in a minute. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, Blue Orchid Hotels and the residents. Now these seminars, I'm sorry, these webinars are all leading up to Engage, which is a track of content uh, at Urban Living Festival. And this is specifically for travel buyers. So a date for your diary, Wednesday, the 25th of November, Thank goodness the government has given us the uh, go-ahead for events of this nature and will be at Tobacco Dock in London. So a little bit of introduction. Um, my name is Mark Harris. I'm the director of the Travel Intelligence Network. Uh, we provide content for travel, hospitality and meetings. Over the last 15 years, we've worked with many travel management companies, uh, hotel companies, meetings providers and technology providers all in and around content and helping devise thought leadership. Some of you may know us from the meetings industry report, which mm. are created. Others may know us from the <coughs> department's industry report. But as far as urban living is concerned, that is an event that's been created. It's the first year of it. What it does is reflect the fragmentation of the accommodation market, the rise of co-living and of co-working. It's no longer purely about hotels and this is an event all in and around that and as you see make sure you're there with us tobacco dock uh, 25th to the 26th of november the two housekeepings for you uh, behind the scenes my glamorous hosts so my glamorous assistants this afternoon are joe and justin they'll be helping ensure that i don't mess up the uh, visuals one point as far as questions are concerned with a number of topics we're going to cover within the next hour and what we suggest is if you've got your questions send them to us as we go we'll then put them to whichever panelist or panelists that you would like to address your questions and you can send them to marketing at international hospitality dot media so don't wait till the end of the session send us the questions that you want to ask i'll be acting as your moderator over the next hour um, those are my credentials, so we don't need to spend too much time on that. More to spend time on introducing our speakers this morning. Now, our panel will introduce themselves in uh, in order. And Kate, would you like to go first, please? Hi there. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Kate Ray. I head the events team at the Chartered Governance Institute. Um, I've been involved in conferences and events for, gosh, 25 years plus. Uh, started working uh, actually with a large informer um, conference company and have consulted with Department of uh, Trade and Industry um, and currently as I said just working with the Governance Institute so a lot of experience with where conferences and events are concerned. Welcome to you Kate and on to Steve. Good morning, uh, Steve Jones, Chair of uh, the MIA, the Meetings Industry Association. And we spent the last uh, few months trying to support the industry, providing some common approach, whether that be to terms and conditions, uh, to opening safely, um, and uh, you know, trying to lobby government and support where we can to get the industry open again. Um, and my day job uh, is managing director of Y Boston Lakes Resort, uh, 400 bedroomed, meetings led property in Bedfordshire, uh, with a couple of conference centres, service offices, hotel, spa, uh, and golf course. So, uh, a, a, a varied business um, that keeps me busy day to day. Cool. And yeah, I'm Paul Hussey, so I'm director at the Conference Doctor, a uh, consultancy that's been running since uh, seven years now, uh, working with private sector, public sector, venues, and agencies. Uh, my background is conference agencies, and I've been in the conference world for about 30 odd years, but now I bring various different angles from conversations with clients all the time, really. That's me. Thank you. Well, welcome to uh, our palace. As you can see, a very broad range of expertise 
add a vast amount of expertise from all aspects of the meeting sector. So let's now talk about, over the next 50 to 55 minutes, let's talk about has video killed the meeting start? There are a number of issues that we're going to focus on in this session. We're going to look at whether buying organizations are migrating from face to face or to virtual and whether that's actually come about as a direct result of COVID and lockdown or was that a trend already happening. We're going to look at how corporates are integrating virtual conferencing into their meetings programs and how they decide between virtual and physical meetings. The role that venue operators play in maintaining that balance we can also look a little bit at how a relevant benchmarking of rates is going to be moving forward we're going to ask whether in future venues have to offer virtual or hybrid options to survive and then leading up to how we restore confidence amongst workers reluctant to attend face-to-face -face meetings <clears throat> uh, it's quite clear that the lockdown has caused meltdown uh, in the face-to-face -face area but video conferencing has probably benefited as a result. And as you can see from two or three figures there on the, uh, on the slide, despite, uh, despite the impact uh, on face-to-face, -face, as we can see, there is now the green shoots of recovery. And a quote from uh, Michael Begley, having seen a 32.5% increase in venue inquiries in recent weeks. So I'm gonna start by asking, and I'm gonna ask Steve Jones to start off with, Steve, is that a fair reflection? Are you seeing more inquiries coming through now? Yeah, we go back um, only three or four weeks. Um, we had our director of revenue was dealing with uh, reservations for bedrooms, spa, golf, meetings, you name it. She was looking after everything on her own. And in the last uh, couple of weeks, we had to bring back somebody almost full time into the meetings office, one person back into the reservations office. Uh, and looking at the volume, uh, we've got to try to bring another person back next week. Um, so um, in the sales team, we had three of the five sales, five sales team kept on and the other two, again, we haven't thought about when they need to come back in because there's just this demand uh, there, you know, the starting to not, it's not all for now, um, but the demand needs dealing with now. So we're having to be very um, careful how we approach it. Well, are you seeing that from, uh, from the organisations that you're talking to? Is there a risk that we're talking, seeing bookings happening, but are they actually taking place? We're seeing bookings happening but they're be they're almost on a roll so uh for instance the agencies that i work with more frequently in track are seeing bookings coming through from clients but then oh postponed 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 so, so the actual physical number isn't happening if i look at this autumn i i track about a dozen of them and what would have been by this time last year there would have been for 1,600 bookings on the books for September, October, November from this little portfolio. And there's currently 172. So even with some activity, it's, it's a tenth of what it would normally be. And I've spoken to some very experienced agencies who've been in the business for more than 20 years. And they said, this week was the first week ever since we started. Well, we've had nothing, no bookings at all. Okay, within your organisation, are you starting to, to book more face-to-face? -face? What what's happening within your organisation? So, quite interesting, actually, you were saying, so for our audience, we, um, we took the decision uh, a few, about a month ago to actually go virtual with all our events till the end of the year. Uh, 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 the main reason was, was the uncertainty at the time. This was before the government announced that, you know, we could start running events but as a, a member institution we needed to let our members know what we were doing we had a number of programs conferences training courses um uh that we need to have a decision to start promoting so we took the decision to go virtual on those till december um and then to start to review it for next year so even actually as i say this the event we're running in january um we have decided to do virtual but from february march and april we are maybe looking at whether venues can offer us a possibly hybrid type of solution um uh, so that there's that sort of um i think we're finding with our members and members is still that uncertainty of whether to come and commute into a uh, london for a, to, for an event is still this sole hesitation so for february march and april i'm interested in seeing what what venues have got as, as a sort of hybrid offering um, so we can kind of, again, as, as Paul said, we are sort of, sort of hedging our bets. I think, you know, I think a, a physical event doesn't, a virtual 
event can't replace that face-to-face -face network um, but we're doing what we can so a hybrid if we could offer that would would be something quite useful i think if we'd all had a quid for every time we've heard the phrase uh, uncertain or unprecedented <laughs> yes. we'd all be sitting on a desert island but kate i'd just like to ask you this move towards virtual within your own organization hmm. What degree has that been prompted by the COVID crisis? Well, was that a trend that was already in play before? So interestingly was actually our strategy for sort of uh, moving into our, our next financial year and for our financial year is July to July we were looking at starting to include some virtual events. It was going to be predominantly webinars. We were going to start bringing in some webinars on board for our members. Uh, that was to really reach out to our members who are not uh, London Trinsic and we have a quite a large international following so what we were looking at doing that obviously when uh, Covid kicked in in March that all got fast-tracked so the first thing that we ran was uh, in terms of virtual was uh, to put our webinars in place uh, straight away and our training courses uh, we were still at that time thinking we had to obviously postpone a number of events in February to June. We were still thinking that maybe November, December we could go physical. But as I said, that moved on. We went virtual. So there was a the plan to do go virtual slowly with webinars first and, and possible look at our training courses, which we run in our offices um, to see whether actually they'll be virtual. Moving forward, um, we are looking at a combining both classroom and virtual on our training courses so that we our reach um, on our training courses can be go further afield than London and the home counties. I'm going to ask the same question to Steve now. So, Steve, were you seeing this, this trend towards virtual before lockdown or in, in your experience, is it perhaps less of a trend? How, how, how do you see that? Um, the, the trend has been happening all my career, so we go back to the 1990s and I was a conference manager, you know, we'd uh, very traditional, people arrive Sunday night on Monday for a week long training course, you know, maybe we got a bit excited and give them a barbecue on Wednesday, but that was about as good as it got. And then the internet became what it is today and people don't train that way anymore. You know, people do so much of it at home, so much of it in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And when they come to site, it's more for the experience side. It may be for the you know, the plenary session, it may be to instill the values in the company, the things you can't do as well digitally. Um, and then, the, and it's just year on year that that's just progressed and progressed. Um, you know, but to a benefit, you know, you look at the organisations, across that same time, bigger brands have come around, you know, small companies have been bought out, we've become a more global uh, in everything that we do. Um, and that's allowed those uh, you know, things to happen, those shifts and changes that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't about digital. So, I think it certainly helps everyone. This has definitely sped it up, you know, um, there's all these quotes going around of how far we've moved forward in such a short pace of time. So I believe it was going to happen anyway. We've just shifted a few years forward in, in, in a few months. Um, but we'll come out stronger for it because you know, we'll embrace it and invest into it. I, I completely agree, um, Steve, in terms of like it has fast track, but I think it, that you can't beat the classroom or the physical side. And I think the virtual almost complements it. You know, yeah. you, you can offer both. You can, this is what we're finding, we can actually offer both. Um, and we're also looking as an institute, looking in, in terms of our, our education side, some e-learning programs. So we believe that both e-learning, virtual conf training courses, uh, classroom cl classroom courses they can all actually fit in the same um, area and not actually compete we at first we were concerned about whether they would cannibalize one another but we don't believe that I think there's different there's different people will offer will have different what will have different needs yeah. and if I just look at my Boston for a second we've got two very distinct conference products we have one that we call the training center one we call the event center and uh, we'd already planned the refurbishment of the training centre and as COVID struck, we said we're still going to have this. Digital will impact. Yes, we're going to, but people will still want to come and have training courses. And, and we know big events, you need to be face to face on the whole for, for larger events. But training, you can add, it can be done online. But everybody says the same thing. You can, but it should be there to complement. It's not a replacement wholesale for it. And that's why we still pressed on with that refurbishment because we believe that business is still strong. It will just be slightly different. Uh, but we've got to be able to have the, the technology and the infrastructure there ready to make it world class and not just acceptable. When people come to site, it needs to be outstanding because they've bothered to put that effort in to go and have that experience. I'm going to bring Paul in at this stage. Paul, from, from an agency perspective, you know, 
no longer is it purely a matter of uh, managing meetings in a physical environment. Agencies are now having to advise their clients on how to combine virtual with the physical. Do you see that as an opportunity for agents and, and how are they dealing with that? They certainly do see it as, a, I say, an opportunity. They're, they're making the most of the situation that they're in. But there's not an agency, I've, uh, and I've just done the survey of agencies for, uh, on a separate thing, but of course it involved me in conversation with them. Everyone has formed some alliance uh, with a partner now who can help to provide assistance to produce hybrid events. Um, and it's sort of split. Some agents want venues to offer that so that they don't have to go you know, further than just calling the venue saying, can you help us in operating this event on a hybrid nature? Others see it as a revenue stream. So they want to keep control of it themselves so that at least they have some bit of revenue from those people who are on an event, but not physically attending on site. Okay, in terms of how you integrate virtual with with face to face, how do you go about that? What what is it that makes you say, right, that event's going to be virtual, that event isn't? Um, so I think for us, we're looking. At, it would be predominantly in terms of our audience and our reach. Um, and in fact, this is why I think we, we we're looking at the virtual hybrid physical because. Um, sorry, <laughs> when we're running events and they tend to be London based, then predominant and there were one day as apart from our, our large annual, which is uh, once a year and as a two day international audience, but our summit events, they're one day, they're in London. So you are only going to get the London home counties and maybe those that might sort of take, um, you know, come a little bit further afield and stay over but the virtual therefore offers that geographical spread so that people who say actually i'd love to go to that, that event in london but I, I just can't or it, it's you know it's a day out of the office um i've got to spend another day when we getting this thing over that that hybrid actually allows us to to reach out to a, a wider audience and our members um so that is one i think one thing actually we'll, we will find quite interesting to see how um bookings on our events change um, and whether in fact we get an increase or whether we get, um, yeah, and actually whether our reach also goes out to further afield to, to overseas, to Europe, say with our members in, in Europe. How much, of a, uh, how much of a challenge for you is it in actually getting people to attend face to face? Is there a fear factor amongst attendees? Yeah. That yeah. Really so, yeah, I mean, one of the main reasons we looked at January and um, when we were looking at whether we go hybrid in January or whether we do virtual was the fact that um, a lot of our members are still very hesitant about coming into London. Um, and as we needed to be starting to market our events sort of nowish for January, we took the decision to go virtual predominantly because of the hesitancy that people still have. Um, so, and I think also with that audience, um, there was, um, which is a, it's a governance for the academics. So academies, you know, money is quite tight. So travel again would be an additional cost. So we decided to go virtual for that event. So there is a hesitancy still. Um, um, I, I, I would love it, you know, come February, I'm hoping that, you know, we can start going virtual, um, a physical hybrid for our February events. Um, because I think you know nothing does quite meet that face to face that interactions. Um, you know, we, 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 we as I said, we're doing all our summits from uh, September through to December. Uh, we're going virtual on it, and we're doing everything we can to make them as interactive as possible. Chat rooms and theme table discussions and all sorts of things to keep polling, all to keep that sort of up. But it still won't quite meet that face to face, you know, part part. Steve and Paul, how, how can we as a sector, how can, how can venue operators, how can associations, how can we collectively restore confidence on the, of, of, of attendees at events? Well, I think there are various associations looking at these things um, and the government has tried to put a conglomeration together. But oddly enough, I cut in on him, but Steve is, is one of the best people to speak to here because so, the MIA have gone further than almost anybody in putting down standards that should keep people assurance. Yeah, the, the, the COVID safe, um, you know, higher the MIA, is uh, you know, listed on the government's website. When you go for the advice on how to operate safely, it says you need to do this uh, and it sets it out. We've put a lot of effort into that and um, it was done um, via the MIA, but speaking to the various um, organisations that are members saying, 
is this practical? Is this workable? Does this go far enough um, to make it safe? Um, but I think we, we have to be honest and say, until there's a vaccine and our therapeutics, there will be a lack of confidence. What we can do in this interim period, whether this be three months, whether it be 18 months, you say, are we doing everything that's practically possible? Um, so whether that be the imaging cameras, you know, social distancing, looking at numbers, uh, the increased hand washing, all of those goodly things that have been across the media and say, are they all laid out? And can you actually do it? But if you think about it logically, a restaurant can open today and have 50 covers in at lunchtime and 50 in the afternoon and 50 in early supper and 50 in late. So 200 unique customers through that, conf through that restaurant during the day. Yeah, we could easily put 50 or 60 conference delegates into a setting far safer than that. Far less different individual people control the environment. Um, so as an industry, we can do it. We are ready to do it. What operators need to be able to do is to demonstrate that. And some of that is through accreditations, you know, um, but the rest of it is physically demonstrating, look, we've already done this. We've done it for this kind of that kind because everyone has a different risk profile. There'll be the first movers that say, Poof, it's not going to get me, we're having our event. And there'll be those at the other end saying, we can't possibly put our people in that environment until we know 100% guaranteed it's not safe. Well, that day is never going to come. There's risk in everything we do. And everyone's on the in-between. So it's how mm. we demonstrate that we are doing it. And confidence will start to come back as to see more and more people doing it. And as we demonstrate, we can do it really well. Um, so... Yeah, it's um, it will be suppressed though for some time, and I think we have to adapt, um, you know, our structures to to accept that. And um, mm. no one says it's going to bounce back before mm. we get to anything concrete in terms mm. of a vaccine, and I don't think that they are sadly disappointed. I think what we do as individuals is very different from what organisations will do as well. Mm. So as Mark, you'll know the trend for uh, that it's duty of care towards travellers that's been. Uh, a big topic in the travel world for the last five years and increasing and increasing. And if you, if you Google now duty of care linked to COVID, um, an individual might choose, yeah, I'm going to travel, but still corporates are very, very reluctant to ask people on their behalf yeah. to undertake a journey yeah. or, or go to an event. Yeah. Um, and, and I so think that's actually, sorry, Paul, I think that uh, it, it's, um, it's you say it's the individual and the organization and so at the moment in time you know everyone's still in lockdown as we all are organizations aren't sort of due to turn their employees back till september you know we've been told me earliest september my husband's earliest september so the organizations themselves are still then actually not a it's almost like then as you come out as we were going down when we were going into it there was restrictions on in organizations allowing employees to attend uh, events and i think that will happen as we come out of it what organizations will say look if you want to go to a conference if it's bigger than 50 you can't if it's smaller you know there'll be restrictions i think on the sizes uh, of what organizations will allow people to go to do you collectively think that we've seen the last of the traditional single day non-residential meeting face to face? Is that is that going to go universally virtual? Actually, that's what I'm seeing when I looked at the, um, the little bits to statistics earlier on to see what was coming up. Virtually none of the events that, that were on, on, on the books were residential. Yeah. Um, so they were all day. Yeah. yeah. We think of a handful of, of uh, day meetings in the, the coming weeks, sub-30, because we've got the, uh, the certification say we can do those, and it's a sub-30 before the 1st of October, and that's exactly what they've been. So um, I, I don't think it's the end of it, because they were coming for a particular reason, and they're coming for the reasons they need to be on site in the first place, because if they could have done those virtually, they would have done those virtually. Um, and these are new bookings that are coming into us. So that's looking for residential meetings or one days. Sorry, yeah. one one day, single day, non residential. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. picked a handful of bookings in the last few weeks, um, and they're, by nature they're, they're small events, but they need that connection. They need to be on site to do it. So, uh, so I don't mm -hmm. believe it's dead. Um, but I was well, there will be some that can do it remotely. Um, mm -hmm. But that was the case anyway. This may give mm -hmm. them more confidence. There is mm -hmm. plenty out there that do need to be. Mm -hmm. on site. Do you think, though, that the key driver of, and, and let's, let's just stay with the, the traditional one-day uh, non-residential meeting, do you think that that type of activity and the decision 
of whether to go virtual or face-to-face. -face. Is that about cost? Is that about duty of care? Where does the balance lie? I think cost, Mark, is going to come into this. Having run agencies through three different types of recessions, there's a big one coming. And you'll find finance directors will look for um, almost any reason to not be holding and spending budget on events. Um, and so I think that it's not just the, the COVID incident that's going to suppress actual meetings happening. I mean, certainly the next six to nine months, it'll be budgets. They, people just won't be given budget approval. I think one of the, the, the flips that makes that, I agree, I think you're right. But where more and more people as a result of this are going to be home working, for some are part of their working week. And so I've got lots of people in our central office and where I'd like to do some of my work at home and some of our, my work in the office. And we're saying, yeah, that, that's fine. No permanent, this is. Um, the offices will get small. We've had new service office inquiries already from people saying, we're not going to maintain this big office that we own anymore. Yeah. We're going to take a service office instead because not all of our team come in every day. And I think that will give rise to more demand for small one day, non resi meetings when they say, well, we're 30 in my department, we've only got 10 desks now, but on X day, 20 or all 30 of them are in, or we need that one day power just to go through it. So, so I think uh, as a result, we'll get new demands for day meetings mm. from people that traditionally have their own desk with their own you know, uh, fluffy toy in the corner of it. Because once COVID's gone, I accept it when COVID's gone, people will hot desk a lot more, people will work remotely a lot more because mm. the technology is so good. That could be new demands uh, that we weren't expecting. Yeah. From our point of view, sort of that we, when we obviously was virtual um, for our events, our webinars, as I said, was a strategic thing which we've just brought forward, and, and it's working. But with running our one-day events from physical to virtual, obviously to begin with, it was purely for duty, you know, a duty to care um, to run these events to get the information out. But cost-wise, and moving forward, you know, we can offer the day rate a much cheaper day rate as a virtual event as we can with a with a physical conference and given what Paul said that you know training budgets will be slashed um you know there is we are looking thinking well actually maybe we should be doing more you know it's it's we're really it's a, a whole unknown at the moment you know hybrid events virtual reaching out more virtuals do we combine both do we sort of run them alongside each other even our day events can I stay with you? Um, how, do, how does engagement with attendees and delegates, how does engagement change between face-to-face -face and, and virtual? How do, you, uh, how do you set about shaping engagement differently? So um, for us, I mean, our, we have our first virtual uh, one-day event coming up in September, and, and this has been on the forefront of our minds, is how do we shape this? How do we do as much as we can to keep that interaction so with our one day um we have with with the agenda that we're doing we're very much pushing things at the agenda to sort of say well actually there's two things we're we're, we're combining the virtual with the conference app so before the event even takes place we are going live we are sending the, the app to all our, our people who are attending that they can talk to another we put announcements on that are happening on the app so they start looking and feeling and using the the, the conference app and the web platform so that they're ready almost when they come to the one day itself. Um, we have been done things like offering uh, theme table discussions for our sponsors. So to encourage people to go right to this exhibition virtual booth sort of thing, actually get people to come and go, go to a, 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 a theme table, um, encourage people to have the sort of live internet chat um, people like to speak to the speakers after the event, they, you, with the conference, they will stand up in a queue and talk over coffee. So we're creating discussion forums for five minutes after the chat that people can then drop in, there's 14, and speak live to that speaker. It's never quite going to be the same, and you are relying a lot on people getting it but we, we we're really we're writing a lot of sort of what you can do and how you how it will work so the people are ready so they're not just launching into this virtual world going well what does this do and just sit there that they're, they're going to be kind of have that experience before during and also after the event we can keep the event open 
for two weeks or whatever we want to do with this platform so people can continue those discussions so i think and i think you know times are changing people are getting more into these virtual conferences whereas i mean even myself four or five minutes ago i was thinking oh my god who would come to a day event for a whole day but now actually now i've seen it and what it can offer and how you can break it down and what the, make it as interactive as possible offer you know it's not one session after the other talking you involve people you get them to do things poll sessions have their say it creates that interactivity as much as you can on a virtual world <laughs> and for an organization that, that runs events that are partly reliant on sponsorship income how are you finding that are you finding sponsors uh, more more uh, amenable less amenable so to begin with it, it was tough because you know it's a new world for everybody and and, and virtual events have been done such as paradically now the sponsors of the experience health and experiences they're a little more willing um, but again it's what you offer them they they the experiences that the bad experiences of sponsors have been told you have an ex a virtual exhibition booth and uh, people will come to you and there's not much into it you know you're not offering them as interaction you i think you have to kind of include them on the agenda in some way and get people to kind of ex move into the conversations so um we've done things like offering maybe like e-goodie bags um uh so that they can sort of um uh, you know sort of say you know, there's any goodie bag as a document or a learning thing or in fact I think my colleague went on on an event where it was an e-goodie bag and if she sort of gave her, her some information she got a cake and some champagne so for her that was great <laughs> you know it, it can be anything but um it, it's how you interact with it. it's getting them involved in the events so we were we're doing these theme table discussions during networking breaks um, and we will offer them out and it's sort of, you know, there's, there's 15, we can have up to three, I think, per break. Um, and we're offering them out and they're on pertinent topics to do with governance and they'll be run by the sponsor. But the, it's things like that. You have to kind of think a little bit over other than just a, a table, which they've got an event, because obviously they're not going to get the footfall. It's how you bring the footfall to them um, that you have to really think about sort of slightly... Um, how do you get over that wall without just literally taking a ladder and climbing over it? Okay. Can I just remind everybody uh, on, this, on the call, if you want to ask questions as you go, you can do that one of two ways. You can either use the chat function or alternatively, you can email your questions to marketing at internationalhospitality.media. So let's now move more on to face to face. Let's move more on to face to face. And Steve, I'm particularly we've heard a lot in the course of the last few minutes about the virtual side. From a face to face perspective, how has the uh, how has the recent months and the recent uh, uh, pandemic issues how have they changed the way in which you intend to run your business as a venue operator? And how can venue operators get a greater share of the market face to face? Um. I think it's a couple of points there. I think, first of all, if we just go back a step and say, if everybody had no restrictions, so time, money, the usual restrictions that stop people, would everybody do these face-to-face -face, or would they want to do hybrid or would they want to do completely um, uh, digital? And, and I think if there were no restrictions stopping you, people would still want to hold the events face-to-face -face, and they, you know, they talk about, you know, they, come into site because it's it's inspirational and now we can get the culture across you know we can make new connections you now um, all of the things that, that you can't do as well uh, virtually um, so uh, i think what we have to do is look and say right well we know what we do well we know what we can offer over and above that we know that digital is always going to be um secondary um and it's secondary in the sense that for some people will really will work they'll say but it means i can attend today or i couldn't attend otherwise great so then it's primary for you but in terms of Oh, well, what therefore we've got to do as venue operators is make sure that when people do come, that they get everything over and above. They should be having that outstanding experience. The venue should be bright and well invested in. They should be leading with the right you know, technology to make everything seamless and work just so. The staff should be well trained, um, you know, so that it's a, um, an outstanding experience. And we have to stick to those basics of saying, you come here for extra, therefore we're going to deliver on that every single time that you come. Because it is a big investment. Because if it's purely transactional of, I need to deliver some training, or I need to deliver a keynote and a message, 
you can do it digitally. But the, that experience of coming to site should leave you going, what we've had, we spent X number of thousands of pounds doing that. We picked the right venue, they delivered, we walked away as an organization with more than we would have done if that had been online. Um, and that's on all of us as operators to, to keep investing um, you know, in our teams, in our properties, so that we can deliver on that. Well, isn't it the case that we spent the last three, four months doing nothing else other than video calls? Aren't we all ready to see each other face to face? But isn't there going to be a demand for that? Yeah, I'm quite sure as soon as there's confidence, there will be demand for that because I think there's also what we've all done over this time is we've done what we've needed to get done. There's things that have been put off that we said, well, we'll wait until you know, we can get together to do that. But the point is, when you can't put it off any longer and it has to happen. So I think you know, that will help with that confidence piece of more and more events will start to take place. But you're right, people want, it's a very human thing. We need the human connection and, and we don't get it. It's a great means to an end. Um, I, I say this, but if people have the, the choice, would they be meeting in a room if it was safe to do so? So I still think it would be. your thoughts? Networking is the bit that's missing most, I think, from the, from the virtual events and, and the hybrid events that we're doing. And it's always been the case, if you go to a, a larger event, uh, the value to an attendee is almost as much from who they meet in the corridor, um, like uh, people are missing in the office, they're missing the, what is it, the water cooler, whatever they call it, type conversations. So you, you're getting strict business done, but you're not getting any of the thing that is the oil that, that makes business work and creates opportunity for individuals, create opportunities for businesses, all the reason why people chose to have events in the first place. Yeah. So I think that's what's but, but I, I go into the office at the moment um, each week, at least once a week. Uh, I speak to my PA daily two, three, four times a day. And on that day I go into the office, I arrive, I make a coffee, I sit socially distanced away from her, and we talk about all manner of different things that she could have raised the day before, the day before, the day before, the day before, but she doesn't. When I'm sat in the same room as her, extra things come out that we need to discuss and deal with. Um, because when you're face to face with someone, those little conversations, like you say, the you know, coffee machine, the water cooler, they start mm. to happen and they spark you know, lots of new things that need to be dealt with. And that's what's missing virtually. It's very transactional and process uh, digital versus face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. It will be very interesting, as I said, in terms of webinars, which are very dip webinars and, and, and our, the training courses, which are s smaller, it will be very different to when our one-day events, when we do our first one-day event in September, to see, you know, how this all, all pans out in terms of the feedback. But you're absolutely right, face-to-face, -face, you can't beat it, you can't beat that sort of bumping into someone. Um, you know, virtual, that just won't happen. They might scan the list and go, oh, that's Joe Bloggs. I'll, I'll message him. It, and it, it's not the same. Um, so, you know, I think for us, as I said, if we go forward, it would be a, a hybrid purely in terms of trying to, for us to attract that virtual, the audience that don't necessarily come to our events. So how do we, how do we collectively help our clients to strike the right balance? What are the key messages that need to go to people who are booking events, booking meetings, when they're looking at the, the whole point of face-to-face -face or virtual or hybrid? How do we strike the balance? Well, I'd, I'd be keen to see some data in the future as with the things that have happened online, what was the um, engagement rate? What was the um, success rate of the information being absorbed? Because um, when people do things digitally, are they immersed in that subject? in the same way that they are when they've gone to that space for the day, that, that venue for the day, that venue for one, two, three days. Um, and if I take myself, if I'm attending a meeting for a couple of hours at the coffee break, you may be checking the emails, you know, seeing what's going on, dealing with things happening. If I go to an event, I commit to that event. I'm in the room, I'm there for that time myself, and I'm out of the office today, I'm at this event, I'll have to go back to, I put my out of office on to say, I'm away to the event for the day. Uh, and I know I absorb far more by physically being on site than I do in that virtual world because I wholly commit to it. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see in terms of that pan out in the, uh, the way the information is absorbed by uh, the attendees. I agree. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 this will be for a, a meeting plan for us. It's, it's very interesting times how, how it works and that reaction because, um, you know, we are getting bookings. We've got some terrific numbers coming in on the virtual events. 
um, as is, uh, but it will, I really, you know, we will do quite a lot of polling and evaluations um, in terms of that interaction and the networking and, you know, what, what could we improve on if we continue to do more virtual. Let's look at now the, the question of the impact of recent events on pricing going forward. How do you, how does the panel see uh, uh, pricing within the meetings and events sector in the UK over the course of the next six to eight months? What's the impact of suppressed demand from events that haven't been able to take place because of lockdown? What's the impact of that? And also, do you see uh, increased demand for virtual impacting on the pricing for physical? Steve, do you want to go first with that? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I look at things different and maybe the advantage of uh, being an independent, uh, I, I can do this versus some of the bigger brands, but I like to keep my pricing very simple. We have a direction of revenue who's outstanding, but our flexing rates is quite narrow. Uh, and I have no intention of putting my rates up through the roof, and I have certainly no intention of dropping the rates back. I think we need to offer value for money uh, for people at all times. Um, and there are some properties when something can be £100 today and £200 the next day, well, we're far, far, far narrower than that. Um, yes, there are seasonal demands um, because it's about what's our product worth. And um, I don't think we should, as an industry, be getting into a price war. I think that just drives quality down. And, and I mentioned earlier, you're coming to site, you're coming because you want to be high quality, well-trained staff in great environment, delivering on your objectives. And um, so we have to keep prices where they are, but people are going to look for value for money. People know there's going to be many businesses out there that say, well, we can't afford it. So let's, and stick to the knitting, do what we do, do it well, keep the prices fair for everybody. Um, and that, that's my view. I know that will be popular with um, some quarters of the industry where they, they may see an opportunity. Um, but but that's, that's where I sit on the matter. Paul, where do you see prices going? Um, so I did my comparison for this autumn coming and last autumn uh, in terms of volume of bookings. So I looked at what the rates were as well. And in fact, this autumn, although it's smaller quantity on the books, the day delegate rate uh, for non-residential, a pound higher. So actually it hasn't slashed or anything like that. People, you know, those bookings that are on the books are more or less paying the same rate as they were this time last year, very slightly higher. And for those few that were residential, they're paying two pounds less on average per, per delegate. So actually the rates have fairly much held up. And I think it's what Steve was saying, venues, I've put in an awful lot of investment to make things work. Um, there will be less people in a meeting room than there used to be. And, it, and I think it's very unrealistic for anyone who's making bookings to expect venues to be slashing their rates for some kind of reasons. They should still be yeah, paying yeah. a good fair rate. Yeah. Uh, from the, the uh, venues that we've had to, where we're looking at um, sort of securing contracts for next year, end of next year, um, their rates have gone up, but not not drastically, as you said, Steve. They haven't gone up in, in like you know shockingly high. Um, almost kind of maybe they would have done you know year on year sort of increase. Um, for our prices, in terms of what we would pay, chart, we're not we're not increasing our our day delegate rates in terms of attending a conference it's going to be exactly the same as this year but for from the from from a venue place from a from a client to venues from what we've seen it's been very small increases isn't it the case that at the end of the day venues already by and large provide a great amount of value a huge amount of value and there comes a point where you simply can't cut those rates any lower is that fair steve yeah, definitely. I think there's a, a misconception sometimes on how much money venues make. But when you look at the expensive of the overhead, you know, the, the physical assets, then the, uh, the, the capital, every, you know, one, three, five, seven years, depending on, on what we're talking about, before the operational overheads, most um, you know, venues, if you boil it down, they're into the single digit profit margins and the early single digits. Um, you know, so um, there's not a lot of headroom in the first place. Um, and then um, uh, I don't know anyone now that isn't either paying or aspiring to pay the higher living wage rather than the minimum wage. Uh, you know, in the industry, the last um, two decades, wages increased dramatically as they needed to. Um, and again, that comes at a huge cost year on year, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds per venue increase year on year to keep pushing those rates up. Uh, but it needs to. You know, people got to have a fair wage, and if you want to have high quality staff, you've got to pay 
you know, uh, better and increasingly um, higher salaries to them. So um, yeah, the, you've got to keep operating, offering great value for money, uh, but there's certainly not the opportunity to drop in you know, 10, 20% off rates. Um, mm-hmm. you know, or these businesses won't be around, um, which would be a shame. And what about so, contracts? You, you, well, you created a business called uh, Meetings Benchmark, which uh, is a venue rates. Do you see benchmarking as being more or less or the same in terms of relevance to suppliers and buyers in the course of the next 12 months or so? I would have answered this differently a week ago because I hadn't done uh, what I just did with this three month comparison between what was happening this year and last year. Um, But I think it's it's prove it will still prove to be very interesting. I don't think people will use it differently. But in terms of a benchmark of exactly what we're discussing, are venues going to be dropping their rates hugely or putting their rates up? Um, then it's useful to know that as an industry, it's fairly static. Um, and it helps those who want to do the right thing to have a bit more confidence about what they're doing and ignore rumour of, oh, everyone's going to slash their rates. They can actually physically look and say, well, no, mm. actually, the rates are very much what they were. So, Kate, from your perspective, for venues now coming to you uh, as things do start to get back to a degree of normality, what's the sort of message that you're that you're giving to venues that are coming after your business in terms of what you're looking for? Um, in, in terms of sort of the, the rates or what, or what, what I'm uh, across, I'm across the piece, whether it be in terms of rates or or facilities. So, in, in so, the normal. For you as an organisation that is uh, sourcing venues and running events, what are you now looking for from your venues? So I think um, what looking for is, is moving forward uh, would be um, the, I suppose it's the added extra in terms of, you know, as you said, the hand sanitizers, the health and safety checks, the sort of more foreignness in 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 in, in, in safety, I suppose, so that we know that if we're bringing our delegates along, everything is is it has been um, uh, that health and safety check is even more so is a hundred percent. It's that sort of assurity, I suppose, from there. Um, we're looking. I mean, in terms of rates, you know, if if we've had some hotels where we've had to transfer um, our our venues through for a whole year and they've been very have just been so great they've just got transferred the whole deposit they've not said okay you've cancelled and therefore well, it's a 60 percent or whatever it is some, some have just been very great and said fine we'll just transfer it we understand the situation um uh i think what we look for i mean it's still exactly the sort of the same as are just day, you know, the day events but i think the added layer is what assurities have you've got in terms of the safety and the cleanliness um and, and, and you know making sure that all the social distancing etc etc is in place see from a venue perspective <clears throat> uh, obviously we all know what the what the law of the land is is now and, and the guidance how do you as a venue operator though adjust to human nature do you, do you envisage there being uh, big issues with, or, or even small issues, with applying things like social distancing? I think the longer this goes on, the, the harder it will, will get. There will uh, come a certain point. The, if you take day meetings, it's, uh, it's far easier. Um, you know, so they're with you for the day, and you've set it out, you've briefed them in advance, these are the rules. Um, but people become relaxed. If you've got an event for you know, three or four days, people staying over with you. Um, you know, that's where um, until um, we get to the next uh, stage of this, uh, we just have to go and again, we're talking in advance with uh, the organisers of the events about that. We're very clear on what our policies are. Um, you know, and we're saying that uh, uh, with your permission now, if this happens during your event, this is what we will do about it. And in the cold light of day before an event, organisers are saying, yes, we support that. So that then gives the ops team and the confidence to deal with it because you're dealing with things um, that a year ago you wouldn't have done. If a group tried to congregate you now after uh, an event you know, in a lounge area, we said you can't do this. A year ago that would have been crazy. You know, why are you breaking into the reason it puts you? But until we get the vaccines in place, until we get some therapeutics, um, but the booker at inception, at the point when they book him, you know, and said, this is what we intend to do. Are you comfortable with that? Yes, we are. Great. And that's how we can give them confidence from, uh, as we were saying earlier, from their um, you know, corporate governance point of view. 
that when their delegates come, we're going to keep them safe, but we can only keep them safe if their organisers agree that we can police them. Um, and if we have to, you know, we, we will be in a situation where I said to people, you can't do that anymore. You know, uh, this has been agreed, this is our policy. Um, so we've spent a lot of time with our team training them on this um, and saying, you know, you're not being rude by doing these things, you're policing the policies. And the reason that their organisation booked us was because we said we police these policies. Um, so those delegates may not like it, but the people that are paying the bill do like it. That's why they booked with us in the first place. Mm -hmm. So looking ahead now, uh, what do we need from government going forward? Uh, every sector believes that it needs to be a special case, uh, and the meeting sector, no different. But what else do we now need from government to support the full recovery of our sector? Um, I, I think this one is, is quite simple. The, uh, the furlough scheme has been outstanding. Um, I understand why it had to have an end date. But if you look at sectors like retail that opened in June, and they have a, uh, an October 31 end date the same as uh, the industry that we're in, that we're still not open. We're not opening until October. So we've now got effectively three or four weeks to recover, whereas um, you know, retail had four or five months to recover. So I think the furlough scheme should have been from the day that you reopen, you get three, four, five, whatever number of months to rebuild your business. Uh, and if that had been the case, um, I would have been able to half the redundancies that I've made um, or in the process of making. Um, so, so I think that's one thing. The, the second one is um, the, the back cut, which has been um, widely welcomed for hospitality, um, for the uh, meetings industry, almost all of our business uh, is B2B. Uh, I'm talking the industry, not, not for my venue. Um, therefore, the back cut is irrelevant. Um, and what would have been better would have been something along the um, employer's national insurance instead of us paying 13.8%, maybe that is zero, or maybe there's a credit of 5 or 10%. Um, something very, very simple instead of, of what we've had, which is, has come at a cost to try and implement, won't make a real difference and won't help us get the industry back uh, moving again. Um, whereas the, the furlough scheme, or the flexible furlough scheme, has helped with that. It's just not going far enough for us as an industry because we've been so affected versus others. Um, and I think that there will be controversial say some industries have taken advantage of it. Now, there's people that we worked with and we've contacted them for a service and well, we're all on furlough, yet their business has grown, not gone backwards, but it was open to all, so they took advantage. Whereas sectors like retail, hospitality, meetings industry that really, really needed it could have done with it for longer. Mm. As a consumer purchaser uh, and utiliser of services like this, what do you believe we need from government? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I think some sort of, I think from the meetings point, clearer messaging really. And, and I think as, as Steve said, you know, um, uh, it, it, restaurants and retailers have sort of opened earlier and um you know events having that sort of you, you mentioned about having sort of the policing and and knowing you know all this could have been set up so having some sort of clear message from government as to what they expect and what they want because sometimes they say one thing and i think this is where confusion comes in and i think this is where in terms of then the audience our audience gets a slightly hesitancy because they're not sure exactly what is you know can we go two steps forward or and now I've got to go three steps back? I think some sort of clearer message as to you know, what's being expected, what is open, what is actual number size are we talking about with, with, um, um, uh, uh, with attendees coming to an event? What actually is social distancing? It's a meter now. Is it going to be reduced? What if it's extended? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's clearer messaging, I think, coming from government, really, for, directing to, for, the, for the meeting, for the venues. Because then that gives us a little bit more assurity and confidence of what we can say to our delegates, you know, it's okay, this is what's in place, this, this is what's going to happen. All your thoughts on this, what do we need from government? Uh, well, as Kate said, clarity, that's, that's an important start for everyone. But there's another sector of the industry that's the, that I often work with, the agencies and the huge freelance staff that work on big, larger events that have been more or less left high and dry by any 
type of the government support. Um, so there are pressure groups trying to get things shifted for this forgotten little wedge of people who've been left without any support whatsoever. But um, that would be, uh, I don't know how they get it. I don't think they will do it now. But there needs to be some sympathy that there's a whole wedge of very talented, very hardworking people that have had no support and continue to get no support whatsoever. They're going to really we, rely on, we rely on these people without them. No, we haven't got, no, the venues won't be full. And if the venue's not full, it's losing money. Uh, mm. So we need those no partners. Um, and, and it's a shame. There's so many of them just been left, haven't we? Okay, we've been rapidly running out of time. I'm going to put one final question to our panel. Uh, and if there's anyone else on the uh, on the webinar who would like to submit a question, you can either do that through the chat button or by emailing to marketing at internationalhospitality.media. And the final question from me to the panel is this. Has video killed the meeting star? And if not, why not? Well, I'm happy to admit me. Um, and no, um, not for one second. I think there's still a real need for that human connection, that immersive experience in high quality venues up and down the country, um, you know, with bright team members, um, you know, with you going away, having had that outstanding <coughs> And I think the technology is outstanding, it will complement that, and we all need to embrace it and have partners to offer hybrid and uh, to support that, but nothing that will take away from that very human uh, reality of needing that connection. Who next? Um, I don't think it's killed it. Um, I think it may have changed it a little bit. I think virtual, um, I think it's virtually sort of suddenly obviously on people's agendas and I don't think it will go away. I think they, people will complement it. I think they will use both. Um, I think meetings may change a little bit in how we, you know, we view them, whether they're smaller instead of the larger events, you know, but I, I think they, I don't think, I don't think it's killed it. But I think it's certainly changed changed perspectives. And Paul, yeah, it's not killed it, but it has rather clipped its wings for the moment. Um, and I think people have learned new tricks and new games. So uh, for the for business that, that uses events and communication either by training or a actual events, I think there's new tools that are now in their box to to, to use. So I think hybrid will come back, and it will be quite a few years before the large events come back to life again. Mm. Okay, well, before I thank our uh, our panel over the last hour, we are virtually out of time. I'm going to ask uh, Joe behind the scenes to bring up one or two final slides. Um, just to remind you that this is the second in a series of the seminars, all for Engage. Engage, as a reminder, is the corporate travel uh, content track for the Urban Living Festival. Now, our next webinar, which takes place a fortnight today, and that's all in and around the fragmentation of accommodation. Hotels, service departments, co-living, buy to rent, short-term rentals, what's the best option? And we'll have another panel uh, going to be debating all the issues in and around that. But don't forget to make sure that you have a date in your diary for the Urban Living Festival. There you have the details right now. Tobacco Dock in London, 25th and 26th of November. It really is a totally fresh take on the accommodation sector uh, and how we discuss that. We also like to acknowledge our sponsors for that event. They're all on your screen now. Uh, and also our headline media partners who are on your screen now. If anyone on this call is interested in becoming uh, involved with Urban Living as a sponsor, please contact Katie and her details are there. But all that really remains for me now is to thank our panel uh, for this morning's session, I'd like to thank Kate, Steve and Paul. Most of all, I'd like to thank you for attending. My name is Mark Harris. Hope to see you in a fortnight. Thank you. <laughs>